Hello, welcome to episode 220 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die from 1983, directed by Shohei Imamura, The Ballad of Nariyama. Ah, I was not looking forward to making this video. It's going to be a different one, uh, unfortunately. It's kind of dis disappointing to me, uh, and it's going to raise the question of whether or not you should judge a film on its own merit, or any piece of art on its own merit, and not compared to something else that's similar to it. Bit of background information. About three years ago, I think it was, I did a video called Japanathon, where I took a weekend aside and watched loads of Japanese films I'd never seen before. It was really good. I watched some incredible films, and one of them was this film, The Ballad of Nariyama, and I absolutely adored it. Uh, in fact, I, it, it, it's great to kind of do these videos because I can look back. Um, because when I finished watching this film a few days ago, I thought, what did I think when I first watched this film? I could go back and check the footage, my immediate reactions, where I'm like, 5 out of 5, 10 out of 10, masterpiece, this was incredible. And that's honestly how I remembered feeling about this film, but I think now I feel a little bit differently. And it's impossible to not be coloured by the experience of having now seen the 1958 version of The Ballad of Nariyama, which I watched a few weeks ago, directed by Keisuke Kenoshita. So, before I get into the comparison between the two versions, uh, I'm going to talk about the 1983 version, the one that's in the book, the one that I'm supposed to be talking about and reviewing in this video. So let's just do that first before I get into the comparisons and how I feel about it now compared to how I did when I first watched it. And there's a whole other part of the story as well, which uh, definitely plays into my feelings on it this time around, unfortunately. Right, hopefully your interest is peaked, but uh, the film itself, the 1983 version, is set in a village, you know, a couple of hundred years ago in Japan, up on this mountain top, and in this village there is a specific rule where when en whenever an elder in the village reaches the age of 70, they are tasked with climbing up Mount Nariyama and waiting there to die, basically. It's a form of crowd control in a lot of sense, you know, uh, and keeping the population down so that there's not too many mouths to feed. You know, they're, they're farmers, they, they make their own food, but they never really have enough food. They're always scrimping by, so they need this in place to kind of, you know, keep the population at a decent level where everyone could still survive. But also, on a spiritual level, it's seen as this... Uh, you know, this very spiritual thing where you go up to the Mount uh, Nariyama and you offer yourself to the god of Nariyama. It's meant to be a blessing if it begins to snow when you do this. It's a ritual, it's a rite of passage, and it's one of those things that's ingrained in everyone who lives in that village. And it's an old uh, Japanese story that was adapted into the 1958 film, and then was also adapted for the 1983 film. Uh, so I wouldn't call this a remake of the 58 version in the slightest. I'd say it's just another version. You wouldn't say that the Hammer Dracula film with Christopher Lee is a remake of the um, Bela Lugosi film. It's just another version of the original story adapted from that, uh, you know, that source material. So this film, directed by Shohei Imamura, is really injected with a, a lethal dose of realism where they spent a year making this film on location, on this mountainside, built this village, you know, and would get the, 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 the snow-filled uh, mountain tops where there's just snow everywhere, it's in the dead of winter, and then you have the snow beginning to melt, spring coming, then the summer, and then the autumn, and so they covered all those different seasons. And that's one of the real strengths of the film, is the realism to the passing of time as we follow these characters over one year. Now, given the, the rule that when you hit 70, you've got to go up to Mount Nariyama, we follow a woman called Orin. And Orin is approaching her 70th birthday. She has a son, uh, she's a widow, and she has a grandson, and she has a small little family who she's kind of keeping together. And her son has recently uh, lost his wife too, and a new wife comes in from the opposite village, and so another mouth to feed. Her grandson is now taking on a wife of his own, another mouth to feed. She's also pregnant, another future mouth to feed. So it really is a case of the writing being on the wall. She has to leave because there's just too many people building up in this household. They're not going to be able to feed all of them. She also has another son who she adopted who is the, the smelly brother, we'll call him. 
very wild hair, everyone says he stinks, he's the comic relief of the movie and the, the sexual comic relief of the movie because he is constantly uh, horny, constantly trying to find a way for himself to have sex with someone to the point where it's just too much for him when he goes and rapes the local dog. Yeah, this film's full of sex. Um, and it's not really graphic, but there's a lot of sex. Sex very much colours the, the lifestyle of the village, and it seems appropriate, it seems fitting, especially back in that time period where sex is a part of the day-to-day, -day and it, uh, you know, is certainly not treated with any amount of respect, especially when it comes to Oren's grandson, who practically rapes a woman at the, uh, the beginning of the film, and, you know, it's just kind of seen as the done thing, and she goes along with it, even though she doesn't seem too comfortable with it. So there are those moments in the film that I don't love when it comes to the sexual stuff, but it does feel fitting to the tone of the story and the realism that uh, Imamura was trying to get of telling this village life. And that's what you get for, for you know an hour and a half of this two hour film. You get this village life and it feels very authentic and uh, there's a lot of memorable moments between all of the characters, particularly uh, Oren, who I thought was great. The actress who played her was fantastic. And one of the key parts of the character of Oren is that she has a full set of teeth, which is unusual for someone of her age, and she is very healthy, which is actually frowned upon in the village. This is seen as a big negative. You know, she shouldn't be as healthy as she is. You know, she should be falling apart at this point so she can go up to Mount Nariyama and die. You know, very harsh outlook on life in this village. And I like the idea of the story. I love the story. It's very depressing. It's very downbeat. It's very, you know, uh, pessimistic. Um, but the idea of being able to know when you're going to die is both a terrifying and a almost alluring kind of thing. Where it's, it's the way of life, you know, and it's something we don't have. We don't have this, okay, this is where you stop. For us, it's completely open-ended. It's this, it could be tomorrow, it could be 30 years from now, we don't know. But to have that set in place where you know when your number is going to be up is an interesting idea. I'm not saying I would want that to be a reality, don't get me wrong, but I like exploring the idea of that through this story and these characters. And we see how Oren fully accepts this fate. She, she welcomes it. She wants to kind of do this. And she sees the more spiritual side of it. And then you see another villager whose father is approaching 70 and he does not want to go up. So you get both viewpoints. You get someone who is terrified of doing this. He doesn't want to go up the mountain. He doesn't want to die. So we, it's not this kind of clear-cut thing where it's black and white and every person in the village accepts this eventuality as, you know, just the way the things are. You have someone who doesn't want to accept it, so you get the contrasting uh, viewpoints on that, which is great. But yeah, like I said, uh, it's, it's haunting when you see how willing and ready Oren is to accept her fate and to accept her mortality and uh, to go up the mountain and, and be ready to do it. But her son is not the most ready of the two for her to do this because he he is tasked with carrying his mother up the mountain it's this ritual experience between a mother and a son it's this parent and child uh, final bonding experience where the the person who's being taken up the mountain cannot speak and so it's this wordless kind of uh, you know very strange and eerie um, passage of the film when her son has to take her up the mountain and in this version that's the most memorable sequence of the film because it's this almost like a silent film you know it's just this mood piece where the son has his mother on his back and he is traversing you know these these mountain ro roads and climbing up these muddy hills and you know, falling down and cracking his toenail and you know she can't say anything he's getting frustrated with this and you know it's a it's a great part of the film it really is it's so memorable uh, that was the one thing I kept thinking about for the past three years, ever since I first saw the film, was that sequence, uh, the last half hour of the film, when he takes her up the mountain. I won't spoil what happens at the very end of the film, but the journey is made. And that is uh, an emotional experience, I think, uh, for anyone who has a parent, <laughs> which is everyone, or anyone who has a parent who they really care about, which is most people. The idea of doing that is, uh, it really gets to you. But, I would have to say that I think that... Uh, the emotions were brought out of me more in the 1952, 1958 version. Anyway, to continue on about the 1983 version that I'm supposed to be talking about in this video. 
I got completely sidetracked there. Like I said, the the, the very um, striking part of Oren's character is that she has a full set of teeth. People tease her about this. They sing the song that she's, you know, the devil woman with 33 teeth. Onibaba is a phrase that gets thrown around, the, the demon hag. And so she takes it upon herself to smash her own teeth out. Uh, her four front teeth. Um, so she finds a stone basin and she cracks her teeth down on it. And then her teeth come out. And she's like, oh, only four? <laughs> Blood streaming out of her mouth, and she runs around to all the villagers to show her, look, see? My teeth are falling out. I'm old. Yeah, I'm going to die soon. And it's just this, oof, it's really heavy. And the actress uh, agreed to have her four front teeth removed for the film. And then I guess fake teeth were put back in later. So dedication is uh, understating it for the actress who played the character of Oren, and I think it makes it so striking. Also throughout the film, a signature visual theme in the film is the use of animal footage. We'll have just these insert shots of snakes, moths, you know, all these different creatures in the in the wilderness up there on the mountain uh, either kind of killing each other or mating with each other. And that idea of, um, of sex being this very primal thing which ties into the amount of sex between the human characters in the film. So uh, a commentary is being made there between the similarities between the animal kingdom and and uh, humanity basically and how we're all at some base level still at that primal animalistic level and uh, the film showcases that there's a lot of tough things in the film there's a scene at the beginning when the snow is thawed from winter and a baby a, a dead baby is found in the, the the rice paddy field that we've been left there in the snow and it's just the way that people um, deal with uh, that kind of thing is is really Again, striking, where they're just like, oh, well, yeah, you know, we need to get rid of that, so we chucked it in the, you know, it's just unbelievable, you know, really, really stark stuff. And I loved it, I, I loved it when I first watched it, and I still think it's a great film. But here is my problem. I watched the 58 version, and that version is, you know, 40 minutes shorter, and it's completely done on stage. It's a set-bound film, and this 83 version is completely on location. It has such a different flavor to it. So in that sense, they're perfect companion pieces to each other because they're so wildly different in the way that they're done as a film, yet the story is is very much the same. Only with the 83 version, we go more into the sexual stuff, we go more into the violence, there's a lot more of that kind of uh, shocking graphic stuff. In the 58 version, you know, it's a lot more tame. It's a lot more family friendly, even though the, you know, the horrible idea is still there and the theme is still there. It's a lot more easier to digest, I think. So it depends what kind of film you like, and I like that the two versions are there because I, I think they're both fantastic films. But that 58 version I think might be my favourite because of the way that it's done, because of the way that it is built in this world of artifice, and yet I felt it more, I feel like, you know? Even though you can see way in the background, that's not the sky, it's a, it's a wall painted blue or, or orange or whatever colour the sky might be in that particular scene. And I think I might have enjoyed the acting just a little bit more, and I think I might have you know, just gelled with it a bit more as a movie. So that is a problem, I think. When you see a film, you love it, and then you see another film that does the same story, but better. And I feel like I'm more impressed by this film because it isn't on location, and yet it feels almost more real, even though the the whole style of it is very staged. No pun intended. You know, there's literally moments where the, the lights will go down, and a spotlight will go in on the characters, like in the theatre. And then the doors of, of a room will open and will move into another location. You know, it's very stage-like. Um, but still, for some reason, I seem to gravitate to this one a little bit more than the 83 version. So that was one part that brought this film down just a little bit for me. But also, I feel like there are things in the film I made an excuse for the first time around. Or maybe I just grew as a person. I'm different now than I was three years ago and I can't let go of some of the things that bothered me, which are some of the animal uh, cruelty moments in the film. Nothing huge, you know? I mean, I've said that films are amazing and there's like an animal death in it, and I don't like that, don't agree with it. In this film, it's a bit more tame, but it's still there. There's a horse who gets smacked around the head, he gets hit with a log, you know, and they're hitting the, the animals. Um, there's a really unnecessary part where a woman goes into a pantry and there's a, a bucket of potatoes, I think, and there's a mouse on top of it and she just, just thwacks it off, you know, and it's like, was that necessary? Did you really need to put that in, you know? Uh, there's a shot at the beginning where they're, they're, sh they're shooting at a rabbit and then the eagle eagle comes in and scoops the rabbit. Oh, that's fine, I guess, but it's when you've got the humans hitting the animals around and stuff, smacking them around, I thought, well... 
I don't know. Uh, bit uncomfortable with that stuff. And again, I think the sex is maybe a bit over the top, and it kind of detracts from how great the other aspects of the film are, which is completely exemplified, personified, in Connie's reaction to the film. She isn't joining me for this, because she tapped out from this 1983 version of the film, uh, 37 minutes in. She was so upset with me that I wanted to show her this film. Uh, because she realized that I was being um, genuine and that I thought she would like it. I hoped that she would like it. Of course, I didn't uh, just assume that she would, but I hoped that she would see in it the same things I saw in it three years ago. She thought it was like a late April Fool's prank. She thought I was fucking with her, and she went to bed three hours early because she was so pissed off that I had wasted half an hour of her life on this film that she thought was terrible. She hated it. She thought it was one of the weirdest films she'd ever seen. She said she felt like it was weird in a way the director didn't intend. She didn't like the animal stuff. She thought the sex stuff was just uncomfortable. And she didn't like the characters. She absolutely hated this film with a uh, almost frothing at the mouth rage passion. <laughs> like she was so annoyed at me <laughs> for showing her this film. And it's impossible for me to not be affected by that. I was so disappointed myself. I was almost upset myself. I was thinking, really? I mean, is it that bad? I don't think it is. I think that it, uh, it has this, graf this graphic nature to it that is going to turn a lot of people off, including someone like Connie. Uh, overall, her opinion doesn't change mine, but I still do think that some of the animal stuff in it is a little bit unnecessary and kind of breaks down or chips away a little bit at this, this brilliant film that had been constructed, the way they spend a year making it on location, grueling stuff uh, to get this film. You know, the woman having her, her teeth removed for the part and that fantastic final sequence of the film which is just uh, you know, shocking and moving and uh, very well done. Overall, I think it's a great film. Is it a film you should see before you die? Yes, it is. Now, do I think that the 58 version should be in the book in its place? Yes, I do. I think this is the superior version. But I'm intrigued to see what happens when I watch this for the third time because I feel like the negativity uh, surrounding my viewing experience tainted it somewhat in terms of my, my watching of it. But my opinion of it hasn't really changed all that much. It's gone down a little bit in estimation purely because I've seen someone else who did it earlier and did it better. So, you know, it is what it is. But seeing as it is in the book, I, I do agree that it is a film you should see before you die because it could be one of those films that you get a lot out of. It could be a film that you hate, like Connie did, and there's always that chance with any film, really. But I think that the risk is worth it, because there's some really great stuff in it, and I think that a lot of the acting is, is fantastic, especially from the son and Oren herself, though I do think I prefer the actress who played Oren in the 58 version. But again, that goes into the thing, should you keep comparing these films when they're, they're so completely different in... Uh, the, the stylistic choices made by the director and you know those stories are there to be adapted again and again and again you know it's not like it was a remake I really I mean there's a lot of lines in the film that are almost you know word for word I don't know too much about the original sto story and source material maybe the original source material was more mired in that sexual stuff and in that case this could be a a much more faithful adaptation but sometimes the most faithful adaptation isn't the best so for me I prefer the 58 version but the 83 version is still worth your time. There's a few things that I don't like, but I have to realize that there are also other films, like, say, Tam Papa, which I just talked about, and I loved. And it had a turtle getting, you know, massacred on screen, and I fucking hated that. But you just got to go with these things sometimes. Um, and if you feel like you care about the uh, animal cruelty and stuff to the point where you refuse to watch films like this, then absolutely, I, uh, you know, totally am on board with that, and I, I you know respect anyone's decision to feel that way, of course. Um, for me, as much as I care about it, you know, it's one of those things that sadly is just a way uh, that films were back in those days, even to the 80s, you know. So, you know, laws are a lot different now, thankfully, although we had that whole controversy with, was it A Dog's Purpose or something recently, where a bit of controversy around that, so it still, it still, goes, on, it still goes on apparently, unfortunately, but, you know, not to the degree that it was, and seeing actual animals killed on screen, which is just terrible. Anyway, so this, I, I really wish this video hadn't become the video it became, but it was inevitable. I probably should have done the review for it three years ago and I'd be done with it, but maybe it's interesting to talk about it from this perspective, having seen it twice now and having a slightly lesser opinion of it. Usually when I see a film and I love it, the next time I see it, I love it even more. 
it's rare that I kind of go, oh, it wasn't as good the first time around. And again, it wasn't just the sexual stuff or the animal stuff. It was just overall, it didn't hit me as powerfully as it did the first time. And that probably has something to do with the fact that I watched the 58 version and was so impressed by that one and so taken with that one. I think that is probably the contributing factor to my slightly lesser reaction to it this time around. So there we go. So that's it for now. If you've seen the film, let me know what you think about it down below. If you've seen the original version, let me know what you think of that one. If you've seen both of them, how do you compare them? How do they stack up against each other? Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.